Well, there's part two of our series called Surprise the World, where we're looking at what is called evangelism and how everyday, ordinary believers are able to play a part in the evangelistic process. You know, we're looking really at a, a two-pronged approach that both the Apostle Peter and the Apostle Paul said that anybody could be able to participate in. Because as I shared with you last week, only 2% of Christians actually have the spiritual gift of evangelism, meaning that it makes it easy for them to share their faith. Uh, I have that spiritual gift. I mean, it just it comes naturally to me just to talk to people about Jesus, no matter where I'm at or if I know him or not. And oftentimes it comes across very, very clear and I get to see a response. But again, only 2% of Christians actually have that spiritual gift. So the question is, how do the other 98% of Christians participate in the process? Because I think for the other 98%, you know that, okay, I'm supposed to be doing something to share my faith, but yet you're often intimidated by the process. It scares you a little bit. You clam up. You like get really, really nervous when you think about sharing your faith with others. So what do you do about that? Well, that's what we looked at last week, that both Peter and Paul said, that, look, here's what you can do. First of all, pray. Pray for those that have the spiritual gift of evangelism that opportunities would be presented to us. And then the next thing you pray is that people like myself would have clarity as we share the gospel message. You're going, whoo, man, that's good. That's all I got to do. I just have to pray. No, we looked at more last week. And that was that you have to, and this is sort of the joking way of saying it, but you have to live a questionable lifestyle. Remember that? We talked about that. You need to live a questionable lifestyle. Now, that doesn't mean that you're living a, a lifestyle that's sinful. What it means is you're living in such a way that other people go, hey, you know what? There's something different about you. What is it that you have that I don't? Because whatever it is you have, I, I want that. And so that's what I mean is you live this questionable lifestyle that people are always asking questions. What do you have that I don't have? And living a questionable lifestyle means that you don't live the same way that your neighbors live. You don't live the same way that your coworkers are living or anybody else is living, your family members, your friends. You're living in such a way that people are going, that is different, but it's a good different. I'm intrigued by that. And when we live in that type of way, it surprises the world. And they go, yeah, yeah, yeah. I need to know what that's all about. So it's all about habits. How do you have some habits in your life that people start to ask questions about it? And last week I talked to you about blessing people, and that you've got to constantly be blessing people, people in the church and outside of the church. That's surprising to people. Today, we're going to look at another practice found from Scripture that's going to allow you to actually be a surprising type of person. So, with that said, actually, usually at that point, I would say turn to Scripture, but we're actually going to turn to a bunch of Scriptures here today. So I will welcome those of you that are uh, watching online with us. All the Scriptures we're going to look at is right there in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. That's called your talk notes. And if you click that, that's going to get you to the fill-in-the-blanks, everything we're doing. Those of you that are here in the room, if you go to our website, exponential.church, you're able to get to all the talk notes as well. All right, so like I say, normally I'd have you turn to a Scripture at this point, but actually I'm going to do something else because I'm going to give you a little pop quiz. You don't like pop quizzes, I know. You're like, we were done with school. We don't want to be in school anymore, but here's your little pop quiz. If you had to put something in the blank, look at the screens here. If you had to put something in the blank here, what would you put? The Son of Man came blank. What would you say? I heard somebody say it, one of them. To save, all right. The Son of Man came to save. What else? To serve, all right? Okay, you guys are actually doing very good for this early in the morning, and maybe it's because you got that extra hour of sleep, the whole time change, you're still not adapted. You think it's, it's actually later. Uh, but here's the thing, you're right. Those two things, the Son of Man came to serve and the Son of Man came to save, those are both found in Scripture. That's not surprising at all. What is surprising is the third time that Jesus talks about this, because he uses this phrase about himself three different times, the Son of Man. And the Son of Man, that actually comes from the Old Testament book of Daniel, that Jesus gives himself this title, the Son of Man. So let's look at the ones that you guys actually talked about. In Mark chapter 10, verse 45, we read this. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and give his life as a ransom for many. Again, that's a scripture that many of you are already familiar with. Right? You've heard that one before. In fact, I quote that one all the time, that Jesus didn't come to serve or uh, to be served. He came to serve others. So that's a very common one. Here's the other one that you guys referenced, Luke 19.10. For the Son of Man came to seek and save 
those who are lost. How many of you heard that one before? Those first two, they actually talk of Jesus' purpose and his mission and how he was going to go about doing what it was that he was doing. So what is his purpose? He, he came to serve others. What is his mission? What is his goal that he's here for? To save those who are lost. That's not surprising at all. Here's the surprising one. Look at Luke chapter 34, the very first part, or uh, Luke chapter 7, verse 34, the very first part of it, we read this. The Son of Man came what? He came eating and drinking. What did he do? He came eating and drinking. This was Jesus' method in fulfilling the first two. Again, his purpose and his goal to, to serve others and to, to save his method of doing it was eating and drinking. And here's what's really interesting as you read through the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, over and over and over again, I want you to do this, look at it sometime. Jesus is either at a meal, he's just come from a meal, or he's on his way to a meal. I mean, it's amazing when you start to look for this. Jesus is always eating. He's always drinking. He's always just doing that. And I share this with you all the time. Our goal as followers of Jesus is to do what? To become like Jesus. So good news. <laughs> if Jesus was always going out and he was eating and he was drinking, guess what we should be doing? We should be always out eating and drinking. Now, here's what you need to understand, though. Jesus did this in a very strategic way. It wasn't just about eating and drinking. It was about eating and drinking so that he could serve other people. It was about eating and drinking so he could help to save other people. And so that's what we need to be doing as well. What is surprising to the world is that Jesus would use the table to be evangelistic. And so again, if Jesus used the table to be evangelistic, for the 98% of you that don't have that spiritual gift, guess what? You can do the same thing. Use your table to surprise and shock the world. So what I want to do today is I want to look at three different things that sort of describe the table. So here's the first one if you're taking notes. The table can be a surprising place. The table can be a surprising place. Jesus was fully God, but yet at the same time he was fully man. And so it shouldn't surprise us that Jesus got hungry, that Jesus needed to eat. What was surprising to people was who Jesus chose to eat with. Now, I already gave you the very first part of Luke 7.34 just a little bit earlier, but let me give you the context of what that verse is really all about. Jesus was actually defending not only himself, but he was defending his cousin John the Baptist and trying to explain to the Pharisees who was criticizing him what they were all about, because they were criticizing John the Baptist for living one way, they were criticizing Jesus for living another way. And so here's what Jesus says, Luke 7, 34, the, the full verse. He says, the Son of Man came eating and drinking, and you say, here's a what? Here's a, a glutton and a, a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Now, obviously, Jesus was neither a drunkard nor was he a glutton, but that's what the Pharisees assumed because of who Jesus chose to eat his meals with because he was eating with the tax collectors, because he was eating with all the sinners and the people that the Pharisees looked down upon. They saw as outcasts and misfits. They just assumed that because Jesus is eating with them and they're drunkards and they're gluttons, then Jesus must be the exact same way. That wasn't what Jesus was doing. Jesus was eating with them to seek and to save those who are lost, to serve those instead of being served himself. Again, this was Jesus' method, and it shouldn't surprise us. What was Jesus' very first miracle? Who knows? What was his first miracle? What did he do? He turned water into wine. How does he announce himself that here I am? He turns water into wine. Now, there's more to it than, than just that, that he just, you know, did a cool party trick, right? There was... Uh, symbolism to this miracle. If you remember when Jesus was convinced by Mary to, to help out the, what was happening because they had run out of the wine, Jesus says to the servants, he says, get those jars there and fill them up with water. Now, those weren't just any jars. We read in Scripture that they were the jars that were used for the ceremonial washing that the Jews had. 
In other words, there was these purification rites that they would have any time that they felt that they had been defiled in any way against God, or if they had come in contact with the Gentiles. Ooh, the Gentiles, people that aren't Jewish. Oh, if I'm even around them, even if I touch them, oh, I've been defiled. I'm not holy. I'm not pure anymore. And so what they would do is, oh, I've, I've been with the Gentiles. So what I need to do is I need to, to go. And, and what they had is these basins and these jars of water. And they had this very particular way that they would wash their hands and they would allow the, the, the water to drip down off of their elbows. It was symbolic of the, 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 the impurities of those evil Gentiles. The people that aren't like us, it's just, it's dripping off of us. It isn't there anymore. And so symbolically, they're washing their hands, and, and literally, they're washing their hands of what they saw as filth. And so Jesus takes this, this symbol, this jar of the holy and versus the unholy, the, the Jew versus the Gentile, and he uses it to perform this miracle, and he turns the water into wine. Wine, the, the symbol of fellowship, the, the symbol of inclusion, the symbol of community. It was amazing. And over the next three and a half years, Jesus continues to, to use the table to just demonstrate who it is that really matters to God. You see this in Luke chapter 7. It's there at the table that Jesus welcomes a sinful woman in. And he's communicating there at the table that this woman matters to me. And she's got to matter to you as well. And he criticizes the Pharisees for what they've been doing. It's in Luke chapter uh, 14 that Jesus teaches us at the table. Who should we be even inviting to the table? And he talks about, hey, you need to invite all people in even the poor, even the people that don't look like you, that don't have the same faith as you, you invite them in. It was at the table in Luke chapter 24 that Jesus reveals himself to his disciples that I am truly God. I've been raised again from the dead. And those are just a few stories over and over and over again. Jesus uses the table and who he's eating with to teach principles about the kingdom of God. Alan Hirsch and Lance Ford in their book right here, right now, they write this. Sharing meals together on a regular basis is one of the most sacred practices we can engage in as believers. Missional hospitality is a tremendous opportunity to extend the kingdom of God. We can literally eat our way into the kingdom of God. If every Christian household regularly invited a stranger or a poor person into their home for a meal once a week, we would literally change the world by eating. And so the table can become a very surprising place just based on who it is that you invite to your table. So the table can be surprising. Number two, then. The table stimulates conversation and community, which ultimately leads to conversion. Again, the table stimulates conversation and community, which ultimately leads to conversion. You know, studies have been done that show that people are much more open and honest and relaxed anytime either you have a drink in your hand or a fork in your hand. There's just something about the act of eating and drinking that the walls come down and you feel much more comfortable around other people. Or think of it this way. When you invite somebody into your home, what is that communicating to them? What's it communicate when you say, come to my house and, and have a meal with me? Because you could have had a, a conversation with them on the phone. You could have met them just somewhere else and, and just stood there and talked to them. But you intentionally said to somebody, come to my home and have a meal. Shout it out. What, what is that communicating? Those of you that are watching online, type it in there. What's that communicating when you say, come to my house and eat with me? What's it say? Yeah, you're interested in them. What else? What else? I love you. I care for you. I want to get to know you better. And so 
again, remember this series is about how can the 98% of you that don't have a spiritual gift of evangelism, how can, how can you play a part of the process? Well, as they said there in the quote, you could literally be evangelistic just simply by inviting people into your house every single week, just one meal a week, and say, share a meal with me. Because what happens at the meal it isn't that you've made them like your little spiritual project or anything. You're just saying, I, I just, I want to get to know you. And as you get to know them better and better and better, you're going to start to hear where they're struggling in life. And now you can take your story and their story and God's story and sort of bring it all together. And just in the midst of, of regular conversation, you know, you just start to share a little bit. You don't have to share the gospel you don't have to expect a response from them right then. You're just sharing, here's how God's changed my life. Maybe he could change yours as well. You know, I've shared this with you before, that people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Let me say that again. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. I shared with you last week that we got the initial results back from our survey that we had done, the reveal survey. And this Wednesday coming up, I have a uh, sort of an interview or a, a consultation, I guess it would be, with the company that we hired to, to do it. They're going to unpack all the results for me in more depth. But I, I shared with you last week, we got some of the initial results. And I said to you that, look, intellectually, we get it as exponential. You guys, when it comes to beliefs and when it comes to, you know, the, the practices that you're doing and, and the virtues... Like, a lot of those things, we scored, like, really high, many times above average. I was looking, and there's now been uh, 2,300 churches that have participated in this, and over a half a million people altogether. And so we scored, like, really high in all that. But what we scored low in was actually putting our faith into practice, into action. Again, people don't care how much you know that you can come in and you can answer all my questions on Sunday morning that I ask you, and that you're changing. I mean, it's great that you're changing, but ultimately, are you helping to change their lives? That's what Jesus used the table for. It wasn't just to, to feed himself. It wasn't just so others could serve him. He used the table to serve others, and he used it as a way to bring other people into the kingdom, and we need to do the exact same thing. So we need to start inviting people that are far from God to share meals with us. Now, I know that that's not what we as Christians like to do, do we? Because once, once people get saved, you know what they do? They, they disassociate from everybody else from the past, and they're like, all right, I'm just going to hang out with the people from my church. I'm going to invite people into my home. They're actually Christians. And you know what? That's safe and comfortable. But guess what? Jesus hasn't called us to a safe and comfortable life. He's called us to play a part in making a difference for his kingdom. And a part of making a difference for his kingdom is helping to bring people into relationship with him. So again, I'm encouraging you to, to invite people into your house that aren't yet Christians. Invite people into your activities and your hobbies that aren't yet Christians. And here's the thing, when they invite you into their house and their activities, go for it. Now, don't do anything that's sinful, but show them that, hey, I'm taking interest in you. I'm taking interest in the things that, that you find valuable. And in the midst of that, surprise them in who you are as a Christian. Show them a different side of Christians and what Christianity is all about. Most of you know that this is exactly what I do with professional poker players. You know what would not be surprising to professional poker players? That would be a pastor shaking his finger at them. You guys are going to hell. And I'm not going to have anything to do with you unless you come to me and my church. That wouldn't be surprising, would it? If a pastor is just shaking his finger. You know what's surprising? When I show up to their table, and literally showing up to their table, And his conversation gets started. And eventually the topic comes to, well, hey, Gilbert, what do, what do you do for a living? I'm like, oh, I'm a pastor. Look, what? What are you doing here? That is 
surprising. That's surprising to them. What are you doing here? What? You know how many conversations I've been able to have about Jesus <laughs> with people that I would never, ever have had a conversation with if it wasn't for showing up at their table? Literally dozens, if not hundreds. And you guys have heard some of the stories and you've seen some of the videos that I've shared with you, the testimonies of these poker players that have come into a relationship with Jesus, that I've been able to help them in their marriages. I've been able to help them with addictions. I've been able to help them in all different types of ways. It's surprising to them when you show up to the table. And so I'm encouraging you to do the same thing. Not poker, by the way. But I'm encouraging you to invite people to your table and get involved with what other people are doing. Show them a different side of Christianity. You see, our attitude so often is this. Well, you convert, then we can be in community with one another. Right? Isn't that how most Christians are? You convert, then you can be a part of us. But that wasn't Jesus' model at all. Jesus' motto was come and be a part of the community. And then conversion will happen later. And so that's why the, my point that I gave to you is just simply this. Get involved in the conversation. Get involved in the community with other people. And conversion, that'll be a natural byproduct then. But if you're always putting conversion first, that that has to happen first, then I'll have a conversation with you. Then I'll invite you in the community. We're not going to be very effective as evangelists. And really, you know, th this was Jesus' example. In his day and a time when, you know, people of different social standings, of different religions, you know, the, the Jews and the Gentiles, they wouldn't be caught dead eating with somebody that was different. Jesus flipped that model on its head. It was conversation first, invite in the community first, and then later conversion happened. The most famous example that we have of this is Zacchaeus. We looked at his story recently, right? Remember Zacchaeus? He was a wee little man. Yeah, anyway, <laughs> he was a little guy. And he climbs up into the, the sycamore tree. And what was he doing? He couldn't see over the crowd. So he, he like gets there and he's like looking down. Jesus comes walking along. Jesus says, hey, Zacchaeus, come down from there because I want to do what? I want to, I want to come to your house and I want to eat with you. Pharisees are like, oh, what? No, you, you can't eat with somebody like that. That's exactly what Jesus did. He went, he shared a meal, and then the conversion happened. Or think about Matthew. Matthew was also a, he was a tax collector. Matthew, he gets into a relationship with Jesus. Jesus had invited him, you know, come and, and follow after me. And, and eventually, Matthew, he converts to Christianity. And what does Matthew do after he makes that conversion? He says, you know what? A lot of my buddies, they need the same Jesus that I have. And so we read in Scripture that what Matthew did is he decided to throw a party. He invites all of his tax collecting buddies over for dinner. Who else did he invite? He invited Jesus. His theory was, you know what? In the midst of us all hanging out, having a party together, eating and drinking, between myself, who's now a follower of Jesus, and Jesus himself being there, Jesus is going to make an influence on him. And sure enough, that's what happens. So it's a, it's a Matthew party, basically. I'm encouraging you, start throwing some Matthew parties. In other words, throw some parties that have a purpose to it. Now, quick little side note. Even though it has a purpose that, look, we're trying to ultimately bring people in a relationship with Jesus, the purpose of each party is not that at the end of the night that their conversions would happen. Right? So you're going to want to invite, you know, maybe one or two other Christians to come and be a part of the party, but then for the most part, it's going to be unsaved people. Just have them in your home. Do a game night. Watch, you know, uh, uh, some movies or, you know, whatever, and just hang out. Hang out. But make sure that everybody that is a Christian that's at that party realizes that the, the goal is not to like, okay, now we're done the game, so everybody now open up your Bible because, you know, it's not a bait and switch thing. If 
If a natural conversation, you know, the Spirit leads at some point for you to sort of privately talk to somebody, then that's one thing. But the goal is just to get to know people, hang out with people that are far from God. Again, show them a different side of Christians and Christianity that they've never seen before. And again, not in a sinful way. Help them to see Jesus shining through you to the point that they start to question, what's different about you? Because whatever it is, I like it, and I want what it is that you have. As we talked about last week, if you just keep hanging out with people, eventually they're going to notice that difference. And then's your opportunity to verbally share your faith or invite them here to the church. In fact, here's what I would say to you. You know, for many of you, the best thing you could do is stop inviting people to church and instead invite them into your house. Because some of the people you know that don't yet know Jesus, that, that jump even to coming to church is too much for them. And so just put an intermediary step in there. Have them start hanging out with you and eventually that door will open for you to say, hey, you know what? Why don't you, why don't you come to my church sometime? Number three then. The table mirrors the character of God. You know, God himself is three in one, Father, Son, and Spirit. And I want you to think about this. For all of eternity, God the Father has been speaking to the Son, the Son has been speaking to the Spirit, the Spirit's been speaking to the Father, the Spirit's been speaking to the Son. It's just been this conversation for all of eternity. I was talking to the men's group the other night. I was in teaching a class with them, and we were talking about this. I was like, what happened before like God created the heavens and the earth? Was God bored? No, because God had this intimacy, this fellowship amongst himself, just this community amongst himself. And I've shared with you before, the actual Greek word for that is koinonia. Koinonia means this deep intimacy, this connection, this fellowship, community, communion that you have. And eventually God says, you know what? This is so good. Let's create man in our image. So man was created in the image of God to do what? To have koinonia. That's why Adam was created, to have koinonia with God, a communion with God. But Then ultimately God says, you know what? It's not good that this man is all alone, so he creates Eve to be like the man. And how was the man created? To be like God. So you and I are created. We've got to realize that ultimately what we are here for is to have a relationship with God and have a relationship with other people. That's really what it's all about. Koinonia, community, communion. And so it's absolutely no coincidence that when Jesus wanted to give his disciples a practice to remember him by, he did it around the table. And even then, that practice that he gave to remember them by had to do with the actual, what they were doing at the table. That they were to gather together around the table to remember him. And while they were there eating together, they were to take the bread and they were to break it and they were to give thanks. And they were to eat that bread in remembrance of the body of Jesus and what he had done for us on the cross. And they were to take the wine that they were drinking. And they were to drink that in remembrance of him and the blood that he was about to shed on the cross. And what you need to understand, you know, we call that communion. We're going to share communion here in just a a little bit with one another. And we're going to do it as a part of a worship service like we do, you know, a couple times a year. But what you need to understand is when Jesus instituted this, it wasn't about a worship service. It was about regularly coming together in people's homes and around the table because it was a full feast that they did. And as a part of the feast, they would take the bread and drink of the wine. So really, the, the symbol of the early church wasn't a cross, wasn't a steeple at a building that they had. The symbol wasn't having a a band or a choir or having a pulpit. None of those things were symbolic of the church at all. You know what was symbolic of the church? It's the table. 
that every single time they saw a table, it reminded them of this fellowship that God wants to have with me and the fellowship that we need to have with one another. And Paul reminds us of this in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 28. He says, this or that is why you should examine yourself before eating the bread and drinking the cup. Now, that's a scripture that's in the, the bigger context. Paul was actually talking to the Corinthian church about ways that they had taken communion and this, this meal that they were having together, and they had like gone way overboard. They were actually getting drunk. And he's like, no, 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 that, that's, that's not what we're here to do. And so he gives all these other sort of instructions about communion. But here he says, examine yourself. And oftentimes when we talk about that in context of communion, it's, you know, pastors will say, or even I'll say, hey, you know what? This has to be like, examine your own heart. Are you in a right relationship with Jesus? Is there any sin that you know of before you take communion? You know, make sure you've made it right with God. And it is that. But it's also, again, in the context of today's message and, and you now understanding what the table is all about, it's also a reminder of not just your relationship with God, but examine your own heart. Who is it that you've been excluding from the table? Who is it that you can be inviting to the table? Because again, this is a part of, uh, of being a part of God's family. And God's desire is that everybody should come into his family, that none should perish, that it doesn't matter who you are or where you come from. God wants a relationship with every single man, woman, boy, and girl. So examine your own heart. And so I'll ask you this question. When was the last time that you invited an unbeliever into your home for a meal? And I'm not talking about a family member either, because all of us have family members that may not yet be followers of, of Jesus. I'm talking about somebody you've been intentionally developing a relationship with at work, or a friend, or a coworker, or you know wh whoever that doesn't yet have a relationship with Jesus. And you said, "Hey, I want to I want to invite you over to the house for dinner." When was the last time that you did something like that? When was the last time you invited a poor person to come and have a meal with you? And said, hey, you know what? We want to invite you to be a part of what we're doing here with our family. When was the last time that you invited somebody to your table that was of a different religion? Because they matter to Jesus too. And people that aren't followers of Jesus, they are going to go to a very real place called hell. Not all roads lead to God. Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is the only way. So you have Jewish friends. You have Muslim friends. You have, you know, whatever other religion. You have them as friends, maybe at work or whatever. They need Jesus. So invite them into your home. Have them at your table. Get to know them. And through that, show them something surprising about this person that, that follows Jesus. Get them intrigued that they start to question, what do you have that I don't have? And so here's what I want you to do. Your next step. Or again, what the survey said that we do very poorly at, of putting our faith in action. Over the next week, you're going to eat about 21 meals. You know, three meals a day, seven days a week, 21 meals. I want you this next week to invite three people to eat with you. Three people. Now, it could be three separate meals, three different people, three separate meals. It could be that you invite three people to come to one meal. And here's the catch. At least one of those people has to be far from God. Somebody that doesn't yet know Jesus. And invite them in. And start the conversations. Again, maybe the name of Jesus doesn't even come up at all at that first meal. Maybe not even at the second meal. But as you continue to fellowship with them, you invite them into community, ultimately then conversion will happen. So put your faith into action. And don't forget, last week we, we learned that bells acrostic, right? That the B stood for bless. So you still got to do that. Remember, we, we said that this isn't about one time you're doing these things, that we got to get into this rhythm. We've got to get into these habits 
of being evangelistic and how we live, of living these questionable lives. So bless three people every single week. One from here at Exponential, one person that's not yet a follower of Jesus, then you got a wild card, right? You can choose whoever you want. So that's the B. And then the letter E stands for eat. So every week, make this a part of your intentional process. Find three people to eat with, of which at least one is not yet a follower. That makes sense? Can we start to put our faith in action? Not just be hearers of the word, but doers of the word? I pray that we can. Let's pray together. Father, we do thank you for this day, and we thank you for this time that we've had together to once again look at your word and to be inspired that we can make a difference for you and for your kingdom. Even if we don't have a spiritual gift of evangelism, we can play a part in helping people to know you. And so, Lord, I pray that we would continue to just bless as many people as we possibly can, at least three, and that we would show people through those blessings, those unexpected blessings, that, wow, there's something different about this Christian. And then on top of that, we would then start inviting people into our homes to eat with us, to to sit around the table with us, to break bread with us. And through that, Lord, I, I pray that we would truly listen to people, as we talked about in the, the previous series. Quick to listen, slow to speak, and we would just continue to listen and listen and listen. We would care about them. And ultimately, there would be something that your Spirit would prompt us to say, hey, you know what? I may know a solution for that. And that then, Lord, you would give us the, the right words to share. And, and maybe those words are simply going to be, hey, come out and check out my church. Lord, help all of us to change the rhythm of our life. It's not surprising when we look exactly like everybody else in our community, everybody else at our work, everybody else in our family. That's not surprising. What's surprising is when our lifestyle is so different that it causes people to question it. So Lord, that's my prayer for each and every one of us that are here and watching online. Help us to live questionable lifestyles as we put into practice the model of what Jesus did, that Jesus blessed people, that Jesus ate with people, used the table very, very intentionally. So thank you for Jesus and using us in that way. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, we are going to share communion with one another here today. And so at this time, um, I'm going to ask, uh, actually, we do have enough here that if the ushers can just sort of dismiss one at a time and the elements are there in the back. And so, Steve, if you can go ahead and uh, do that. Grab your elements, keep your elements, wait until you're in your seat, and then we'll actually share them all together. So um, you're dismissed as Steve dismissed.
those of you that are watching online with us, hopefully by now you've had an opportunity to grab your elements as well, and you'll be able to participate with us. After the supper was done around the table, Jesus took the bread and he, he broke it and he gave thanks. He said, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. And so today as we together here at Exponential and those of you watching online as we eat of the bread, I want it to be a reminder that Jesus' body was broken for you. He freely, even though he had no sin, gave up his body for you, sacrificed his body for you so that you could be in communion with God, be made right with him. And so as we eat of the bread, I want you to be reminded that since Jesus gave up his body for me, I'm now going to give my body back to him in service to him. And so let's take the bread together and offer our bodies back to him. And likewise, after the supper, Jesus took the cup, poured out the wine. He said, this is the blood of the new covenant. And what Jesus was talking about was the old covenant where sin was forgiven by the shed blood of lambs and, and goats and, and bulls. That wasn't going to happen anymore. Jesus himself was going to become the perfect lamb of God that was going to take away the sin of the world. And ultimately, that's what Jesus did. He went to the cross and he shed his blood. Scripture makes it very clear that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. That blood has to cover our sin in some way. And it can't be our own blood. It can't be our own efforts. It's all about Jesus shed blood. And his blood was a once and for all type of deal. And so if we put our faith in Him and what He did for us on the cross, shedding His blood, all of our sins are washed away. They're never remembered again. And because our sins are washed away, that means then that we can now have eternal life with Him because His blood makes us perfect in the sight of God. And so today as we take the cup together, I want you to be thankful, number one, that Jesus blood has washed away your own sins. But then be reminded that there's other people that you know that need to come to the table. They need to be there at the table because they don't have the same forgiveness that you do. So we're going to take the cup again in thankfulness for our own salvation, but as a reminder that our job is to go out and surprise the world, to share with other people the good news of who Jesus is. So let's take the cup together. Jesus, once again, we do thank you for who you are and all that you're doing in our lives. Most of all, today, we're thankful for what you've done in the past. The 2,000 years ago, you lived the perfect and sinless life. You died on the cross so that our sins may be forgiven. And to prove that you truly are God, you rose again from the dead, victorious over sin, victorious over disease and sickness and even death itself. And yes, while death will come for all of us here on this earth at some point, we don't have to experience the ultimate death, that punishment of hell, because you've given us new life. We have been born again. And now it's not about us. It's about your spirit that lives inside of us that, that washes away our sins and covers over all of our sin. So Jesus, again, thank you for your body and for your blood. Help us never ever to take that for granted. Help us not to live for ourselves 
Help us to instead serve others in the same way that you did. Help us to remember that you came to seek and to save those who are lost. So help us to join you in that mission by just simply opening up our tables in our home for all to come in and to be a part of. Conversation and community first, conversion later. Thank you, Jesus, that you use simple people like us to make a difference for you. And I pray all this in your precious and holy name, the name of Jesus. Amen.